I so do. this is the part where it's like we've done a deep dive. Oh no. We've done we're on like page 13 of Google. Real Peel the agent. onion back. Exactly. <laughs> We're really excited to uh, get this project rolling, and the folks from Martin Guitars are in town. And Jerry is the director of sales North America for Martin Guitars. Thank you for coming. Oh, my pleasure, Joe. Thanks. So, a lot of people don't know we're in Pittsburgh. Nazareth, Pennsylvania is eastern Pennsylvania. It's about, what, five hours ish, five and a half hours sure, sure. out um, east. My wife's family is from eastern Pennsylvania, so we're out there a good bit. And I've gotten to know people throughout uh, the industry differently over different levels. And you and I met at the last NAM show. Yeah. Pre COVID pandemic. Yeah. Yep. yeah, sure. And since then, all sorts of stuff is happening. So you're now the director of sales in North America. So I think what I want to do, I think like the way I flesh this out and we'll let it kind of run rampant, is I want all of the people that follow us to understand kind of like what it's like to work at Martin Guitars, your path. We get asked a lot um, of questions about the the interactions between us and brands. Who has good? You know, brands have good reputations and not so good reputations. Okay. Working with uh, you know customers, you know Martin has a great reputation, but awesome. we all we all know the places that sometimes like you know people are like oh what's it like to deal sure. with such and such you know sure. and there I think a lot of our our customers are really interested in kind of like the path it takes and the people that you meet. And I think a lot of times they would find that. Um, and even in this week with you know, all these folks from Martin being here at Empire for our anniversary, that the backgrounds are really wildly different. You know what I mean? And for it's sure. just like, and let's just, so let's start, you know, you took the title of Director of Sales North America in February, 2020. What does that? What does that mean? What is, what's a, the, the overall scope of your position? Sure. And then kind of like, what's like a day of what you think is a normal, hey, I wake up. And this is like kind of like the way I would tackle my day, or these are the things that I, sure. you know, encounter. Sure. So, so um, responsible for all sales activity, and and um, you know, from from our border, north of Canada, all the way down through, a border south of the United States. And in at a general level, it's just to make sure we hit the revenue number for the for the for the company in the territory that I am responsible for on guitars and strings and resale. Um, so every day I kind of think up, think uh, I'm going to start the day with what's the strategy of, of, of the territory? What's the strategy of the team? What are we going to do? And then inevitably, like you as a, as a business owner, there's always fire drills that, that sometimes crop up. So um, pandemic was one of them. You know, for years, I'm a sales guy. That means I knock on your door and say, Joe, will you take one? Will you take two? How about three of these? And uh, it's just been dramatically different over that <laughs> over that period of time. So so we're getting back to that now. We're, ba we're back to actually, you know, knocking on doors and, and having conversations with our partners to say, um, what can we do to help you? What, what do you need from us? What can we help provide so that you can attain your revenue targets? Yeah, so essentially during the pandemic, it was not, will you take, it was me coming to you and your DSMs saying like, can I get more, right? Oh, and yeah. it's like your, your obstacle essentially was under production to demand. Correct. So how do you see things moving forward? Because this is a, a big conversation in our industry right now. Sure. Like, you know, the, the pandemic was so interesting because there was the initial, I mean, there's the fear of the, you know, your proximity to Philadelphia, New York City, there was a spotlight on Martin Guitars in the For industry sure. without a doubt. I think, I feel like you guys and Steinway specifically had the most eyeballs on it, like, okay, what are you going to do? Because the, the really the ground work was laid there for the outbreak in the sense of the most, most people and how it was impacting your businesses. And there was the fear of that and obviously just the general fear. But then also inside the industry, it's like you said something yesterday. It's like you have X amount of dealers and you're expecting way less at yeah. the end of this, right? Like, yeah. you know, we, we weren't expecting a boom. Um, Not at all. Which presents its own issues, right? Because Martin Guitars, if you guys haven't heard, it's been open for a minute. Uh, you know, it's, 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 <laughs> it's seen some things, you know, and it's just like, but there wasn't really a way, I don't think, for most manufacturers to plan for an increase in demand. So how long, you know, let's just really quickly, so you, you guys were shut down for how long? Yeah, so March, uh, March of 2020, don't hold me to the exact date. Let's call yeah. it St. Patrick's Day. Sure. Being that I'm Irish. St. Patrick's Day comes and all of a sudden everybody, it, we get a message from the governor. You, you shut down, everybody goes home. Um, so, so we did just that, not knowing 
what we're going to do the next day or the day after that, the day after that. So first couple of days, we just made sure everybody had a place to go. Everybody was okay. Everybody, everybody was fine. Uh, and then we, we started to realize that, you know, there were other parts of the country that had not yet shut down. And they were calling in and they were saying, where's my guitar? And consumers were calling customer service. So we had to very quickly um, evolve to become a very nimble organization. And some would argue that we didn't start that way. Um, we, you know, virtual technology overnight, you know, customer service reps working from their dining room table with their laptop and a headset that connected them directly to our phone system in Nazareth. That had to be done right away. You know, because while we were living a, a different type of what's going on here, there were a lot of parts of the country that was, at least for the yeah, first business week, as usual. it was business as yeah. usual, at least for the first few weeks. Um, and you're right, then, then, then all of a sudden, um, you know, people were, that were open said, well, can I get my stuff? And here in the state of Pennsylvania, we, we, you know, we were shut down. We got permission to have seven people go back into the distribution center so we could at least begin to receive product. It wasn't, the concept wasn't to, to ship out. The mm -hmm. concept was, hey, we got truckers that are showing up with very expensive raw material, as well as supplies from our other factories coming up. And uh, so we were allowed to receive. When we were able to uh, get that completed, and suddenly we said, well, while you're in there, <laughs> you, know, you know, we still have this machine yeah. uh, that we have to feed, you yeah. know? So, you know, we got these orders, can you pick and pack them? And, 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 that, and that's what started. As that was happening, you know, uh, no different than you as a business owner, our team was strategizing, what is this going to look like? And, and that's when we started to think, oh, my God, oh, my God, you know, what, what could this be? Um, but we just got up every day and just tried to figure it, figure it out that day. I'm sure. You know, it's easy to look back now and go, you know, how, you know, how successful we were or where we could have could have learned. But in the moment, we were just, just trying to survive the day. For sure. And now how do you see, so that evolution, sales skyrocket, back orders, the whole bit. Now we're entering this thing where there's a return to a normal pace and demand. You know, it's just, how do you see the industry as a whole? Do you see it as healthier? Do you see it as in a state of flux? And how do you see Martin compared to how you view just the total ethos of sure. the music industry? Sure. So, so I, you know, I'm, I'm, I tend to be a glass half full, half full guy. So I still think that the industry is pretty strong. You know, obviously we all had a, an extreme boom, right? And as things start to come back down, um, I still think there's an, an awful lot of activity because that was not normal. That boom was not normal. Mm -hmm. um, so if you go back and you look pre-pandemic, maybe 1918 as, as measurable years, I think everybody's kind of still above that, which is good. As it relates to Martin, um, we, we delivered a lot of product. We've had, we've had some very good months, uh, and we could have been more, as you said, if, if, if we were able to. But in the acoustic manufacturing process, it's not, it's not dynamic. It's not like you just add another pod and you, and you spit out another 10 guitars. So um, we did respond, albeit a little so to, some, so to some's liking, but we hired a lot of people. And, and, and we, we introduced a second shift uh, to, in those areas that were problematic. So what does that mean today? It means that we're still producing at those boom level numbers because as our partners around the world are starting to get enough stock, what I mean by enough, enough to handle their demand, there's also the back stock um, around the world. Your back room, you mm -hmm. need to have a couple extra guitars. More than, more than you said yesterday, you know, if I got to sell five, it means I got to have 10. Right. Right. So this is the same thing with us. We know that, that our, our value price product is, is getting to that point now where inventories are, are at their desire to match demand, and now we just got to fill the back room. And the Nazareth made product is the same thing. We're still a little bit behind, um, but our, our projection is, is, or I should say, trajection is um, to be very, very strong by the end of the year and early 23. It's interesting because throughout the, um, the whole ordeal, looking at it from how like I look at it, acoustic guitars are a very much like a Martin guitar is a complicated tool to build. Mm -hmm. You know, especially a, a USA guitar with lacquer finishes and you know it's like these these aren't solid body electric guitars that kind of assembly line piece together sure. more quickly. And it's interesting because we were talking about this yesterday. Martin has a new CEO. Yeah. Chris is still a really big part of the business. You know sure. I mean it's just like it's you know it's it's um, 
you know, it's his name and he's always going to have, and he has tons of experience in these times because when he came on was a very not great time, yeah. right? In Martin or guitar, acoustic guitar history. I mean, it in wasn't general, just like, a, sure. it was a really, you know, it's, it's funny. I always feel like, um, you know, Chris is not known as a guitar guy, right? You know, it's just like, it's not like he's going to put a video out on YouTube of like shredding you yeah, know, right. a Martin guitar. It's not his deal, right. but his manufacturing prowess is very well known. And what he did in Mexico is, was really for the acoustic guitar business was pioneering for sure. Yeah. And he's, you know, I think he doubled your total historical builds in a very short period of time. You know what I mean? It's just like, Absolutely. so you'd seen a lot of this and you guys did not take the grab any warm body, stick them in the factory and we're going to make some stuff and see how it shakes out approach. Right. You took a smaller hiring approach and we were talking like you really, you're not in a layoff situation. No. Which is news in our business because we, you know, Fender had the big news of they had massive layoffs and overstocking and all these things that come from, you know, it's like obviously they made more guitars during, but now there's, you know, <laughs> there's a backside it, to that. It, it, of course. So it's just like, do you feel like the staffing that you have and the pace that you're on is like a new sustainable level for yes. where you'll be? Yeah, I mean, so, you know, to your point, Chris has had the benefit of being around a couple of booms. And while the sales department was screaming, we need more, we yeah. need more, we need more, there was a level of, of uh, confidence to it. okay? And, and we did hire, and we did, you know, at a, at a significant level for us, maybe not for what others wanted us to do, but we, you know, we were hiring 10 and 20 at a time, while others maybe were, were hiring 50 and 100 mm -hmm. at a time. Um, got our second shift up and running, and, and, and probably increased our daily output in both factories, you know, you know significantly, mm -hmm. well, instead of talking about numbers, sure. significantly. Um, Having said that, you know, uh, now that some of those factories are slowing and we're not having to produce X numbers per day, um, we, don't, we don't have that labor situation that we think, because natural attrition happens. You sure. Know? In, in, a, in a production environment, um, that's why it's so wonderful when people say it in Nazareth, they, you know, I've been there for 25, 35, 45 years, because you don't normally see that in a traditional factory environment. Right. But um, there's, there's retirements that are going to happen, and then there's some people that are going to say, this guitar-making thing ain't for me. So we're not really worried about um, any attrition levels. And in fact, the, the headcount we have today, we think are, it, it, we're still planning on having higher than pandemic production per day. Yeah, and that's right? so a bonus. So that's still the bonus. And, and, sure. and because we were so behind for such a long time, to fill the back stock around the world is going to take some time. So it's, we're, we're very confident. We're poised to be in the right spot. Yeah, that's cool because like the first time I toured the factory, you know, historical context is always, it's difficult to um, place sometimes. You know what I mean? It's just like I said yesterday, um, what I love about the factory and the feeling I get there every time is that some of the world's most important instruments have come Came right through, through those holes. Building. It's like, yeah. I really think that that is like the, the sounds that have shaped the music that we all listen to. 100%. They were born in that space and that it's like even saying it gives me like goosebumps i just think it's so wild but the, before i even had that like a f that kind of observation touring the factory and you see you know people working at a bench and they've got a picture of their mom who worked at that bench Correct. or their grandfather who worked at that bench and you know the um, first time i toured through like the ladies are doing the bracing and you know what what hit me in that is the the kind of the pride in your your craft you know what i mean it's not um you know martin is much more technologically advanced than people people think Incredible. it's like geppetto's work uh, yeah. wood shop and everyone thinks like it's like the jetsons work at the tailors and there's like there's a fine line yeah. you know in in each you know what i mean yeah. it's like you guys are introducing a lot of technology that lets the skilled people do their skilled jobs better cool. you know what i mean and it's like and that's really important uh, but the growth you guys had was a, is just a, a cheers to you guys is that we didn't send a single guitar back during that time. And I can tell you, I can show you my inbox with RA labels to other places. And it's just like, man, they're just putting out, they're stuffing what they can stuff in a box and like cross your fingers. And people were so hungry for product that it's almost like, is the end user going to complain? And I, I don't like to do business that way. I think that in the end, like you might get away with that once or twice, but in the end you're, 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 long-term view is is really lousy yeah. there so you guys did a phenomenal job i do picture because you know, i i talk, <laughs> talked to you yesterday and you were talking about like having these like like prolific months and celebrating them. i picture like a wolf of wall street moment where you're like giving a speech on a microphone and everyone's just going like crazy <laughs> in the bullpen so it's just kind of kind of fun to to like see that there's like all the success but it's a it's a sustained success which is is really important and i can speak directly to empire situation with you guys it's like 
we aren't in a position where we have tons of stuff in boxes that isn't necessary because that's always bad that's bad for everybody you know right. what i mean it's just like that's not a good situation so the pace and that allows the product to still be great and you guys didn't kill people on the pricing and um i wonder we'll talk about obviously material costs and things like gut how big of a talking point throughout all this was recognizing like even though you're going to absorb these short-term costs and maybe they become long-term yep, costs for sure how does it impact the price of a, a d18 are you is that something in your world that you guys are hyper aware of and saying hey listen like right now we really should be charging x for model y sure. but it's just like the reality of it is is like let's wait a minute and absorb some of that for the time being or is that kind of like not something that you're talking about because i would imagine in sales that's a big part of what you would do yeah we're we're on the end we're on the receiving end of that like the, um because we we know when we talk to our customer base whether that's going to be received well or not or understood well or not so every everything's up for a debate but, but my my understanding because i i'm not in those day-to-day -day conversations okay. but um again that same controlled measured response that we did to the production demand was the same controlled measured response as was the cost increase. Let's face it, everybody in manufacturing was living in a just-in-time kind of mentality. We all believed that you could order a nut and bolt three weeks before you needed it, it would show up just in time, yeah. and you could put it just in place. And then um, you know the global supply chain imploded, and then there were premiums put on everything, and then premiums to put on the fuel to get it to your building. Sure. If I'm sure that every increase that we received as an organization was not passed on, sure. or else the price increases would have been horrific. Absolutely. But I do believe the history that we have lets us know that there'll be an ebb and flow. Yeah. And and this too shall pass. Sure. Um, if this too does not pass, then we'll have to address that at that time. Mm -hmm. But there's nothing on the agenda that I'm aware of right now that says as soon as we hit pause on this on this, you know, discussion that there'll be a price point that right. we have to talk about. Well. Anybody from Martin who's watching, your friends appreciate this because the, we were laughing, the guys at Boss and Roland, we would get a new pedal price list like every week and it would be like, the, you know, the, the DS1's going up $2. You're like, oh, <laughs> damn, I gotta go into your computers. You gotta go on like every website and change all your pricing. It was just like such a headache. So the steady approach is appreciated. Now let's talk about, you wanna work at Martin Guitars. Like, you know, it's like, I have this, like, you know, it's like I'm a person on the street. I admire Martin Guitars. Yeah. Do, does your, like you're, you came up, I was like looking, so you know, you can do a fair amount of research, right? And you had, you've had a, a, a pretty long time. How long have you been at Martin? I'm there 12 years. Yeah, exactly. You started like, I think like 2011 or something yep. like that, right? Yep. Like with, yep. uh, you know, you started as a sales manager of strings, right? Yep. And then international sales manager, then director of sales, then here where you're at. Right. I guess, what was that? What, what was the director of string sales? That's what it was, right? Yeah, and then, global director of string sales. So where you're at now. So you like, yeah. you've managed a lot of sales channels and sales products, right? But before that, I saw you were VP of sales and marketing at Camelback Mountain Resort. <laughs> Tell me, now this is where, this is, I think, it's funny. I feel like when I meet people in our industry, there's two career paths, right? The person that like, the doctor smacked them on the ass and they were handed a guitar and it's like, it's all they could imagine doing. And it's just like Correct. one track, one track, one track. They are born into it. Like I was born into the business and my parents sure. owned a business. It's like, I just, I just, just, there wasn't. It was there was not a, an X and a Y in the cross you know, in the in the crossroads for me. It was just sure. like a straight path. You had no choice. So explain to me like, you know, <laughs> you're at Campbellback Mountain Resort. They've got a water park. They've got skiing. They've got uh, events and all that stuff. Yeah. Like where where does this jump happen from something like this? Because looking ADP, we're just talking about a cable company, which I'm going to have you tell this anecdote here. That you, how does all that experience lead to? being at Martin Guitars? Joe, that's a great question. So, you know, um, first and foremost, I'm living in Nazareth during all this, right? So I, we, my wife and my family, we, we relo relocate to Pennsylvania in the late 80s. And, um, you know, fast forward to the timeline you're talking about, I'm driving past Martin Guitar every day, every day. And some of my closest friends are in that building, right? So you're a guitar player, so naturally you want to sell guitars. I'm a salesperson, mm -hmm. right? Um, and my background shows I can show, I can sell tangible things or I can sell services, and because selling is really just conversation and filling needs, right? Problem so, solving. Problem yeah, solving. Amen. Oh. If you got a product that you don't need, you ain't gonna buy it. Yeah. No matter how many price discounts right. I give you, but if you got a problem that you need uh, 
solved and, and my product or service helps you, it's a win, win, win all uh -huh. the way around. So there was a former gentleman that worked at Martin Guitar. You may know him, Bruce Mariano, great buddy of mine. He's a life mentor of mine. He teaches, okay. teaches me not only how to be a sales guy, but how to be a dude. Okay. Right? Um, he kept saying to me, you got to come work here. You got to come work here. And when you live in Nazareth, you, you, you talk about guitars <laughs> or, or you talk about um, Mario Andretti and race cars. Yep. If you, if you can't have a conversation about the two of them, they shun you. Yeah, you're a clear outsider. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you're an outsider. And with this accent, I already had a problem. Yeah, exactly. Right? They knew from the start that you were from, from faraway lands. So. Correct. Correct. So when, when, when I realized that uh, after many years of, of selling lift tickets and, and flip flops, you know, for the summer and water park up, up at Camelback, that I wanted something different, there was opportunity at mm -hmm. Martin. And, um, you know, I didn't think I would stay selling strings. I, you know, my ego said I was going to be the king of the world in sure. that building. And, 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 uh, but it is dramatically different. Um, the, the culture at Martin is very rewarding for me. And I hope most of my colleagues feel the same way. Yeah, I think it's interesting because like the sales thing, I would say if my parents owned a toaster factory, I'd be a, a toaster salesperson mm -hmm. right now. You know, I own a toaster store because I just love the machination of the business. And the sales side, it's, it's interesting because I don't know how dialed into social media you are personally, but there's all these like sales gurus, right? And you yeah. hear them talk. And I was thinking, man, like these are like, and they're all very like wealthy and things yeah. like that. But it's just, like, to me, it's always like, you know, if you're selling a premium product, right? You know, it's a customer wants a premium instrument and we're offering Martin guitars. My day is like 90% done. 100%. It's really just finding the right tool for the person for the, in their needs and their wants and all those things. It's really, really easy. And that's something that, um, is inherent in the brand and something I've noticed of, you know, I've been selling guitars a long time. And I always think of in the uh, mid nineties when acoustic electric guitars got to be popular uh, and like Takamine Innovation were massive and you guys weren't putting pickups in acoustic, you know, you weren't putting boxes in the sides of guitars. It hadn't been fleshed out yet. And the second that premium brands started to do it, those brands, instead of keep making great guitars, just started to make crummier guitars cheaper. You know what right. I mean? It's like, and you guys have always had a, a culture of excellence. I think that's, uh, very apparent, you know what I mean? And it's interesting that, you know, like the experience of selling a ski package or an event for a corporate event at a resort really isn't much different than what you 100%. are doing to help your us, you know, at Empire Music, you know what I mean? Like our customers need experience and you need to deliver it. Correct. And it's like, it's, you know. It's, the, 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 the Martin brand has afforded uh, a lot to me, to your point about get out of the way, right? Show up, Bring the product or service, solve the problem, be, be an effort, respect the brand, and then get out of the way. Because to your point, for 189 years, is it now? Yeah. Uh, they've done it better. They, I did, they don't need me to screw it up. So, so what my team and I have to do is we have to facilitate the tools you guys need to be successful on your side. To your, you, you couldn't have said it better. We put what we make. The guys on the other side of the wall, we call them, the, you know, the manufacturing gurus. They make my job very easy. Mm -hmm. They make to hear you say during pandemic and that boom and the push and to have, you know, not one guitar need to be sent back. That that's monumental to the statement of get out of the way. Show up with a guitar, give it to you. Make sure you have the the uh, the marketing to help move it, and then and then let you do your job. Yeah. How do you see? the role of brands changing because we were talking yesterday about direct sales from yeah. manufacturers how do you see like the and not for martin specifically because um you know I, i'm more interested industry-wide how you see the evolution of how brands interact with stores and will retail stores still be a prominent or necessary place you know what i mean like was we at empire here have spent a lot of time um you know, we had the same thing during the pandemic. It's like, basically we showed up every day and filled order. It was madness. It was just, you know, it's like, it was really a wild time, but now it's like, we're kind of back to a more normal pace. And we've been focusing on taking trade-ins to help customers, you know, 0% financing things that before we weren't even talking about, people were just trying to grab guitars that were hard to find. Sure. You know, it's like, so I feel like even the least organized guitar shops in the country had a great period of time you know it's like it would be if you came out of this in worse shape i don't it's, it's very hard to imagine that you know I what agree. i mean it's just like it's if you have a cell phone in a few seconds you can get your guitars online and move them whereas now it's just like we're back to like like we're, we're really focusing on used guitars to help customers find the right thing and like they want to upgrade to a martin guitar you know how would we do that you know it's like so to 
to be relevant in the retail space. Do you see, how do you see manufacturers changing with that direct to consumer channel, obviously staring everybody in the face, whether you're using it or not, and still a dealer network that is still prominent currently? Sure. Um, well, listen, it's inevitable that um, you have to get closer and closer and closer to your customer. And customers are demanding that, that connectivity to us. So for us at Martin, you know, we utilize the social media aspect to try to stay as close as we possibly can. We've been, we've been selling you know, T-shirts and hats online for, for over a decade. Mm -hmm. So we do, have, we do have some interaction with our consumers. Um, but they, the, I can't sell every guitar I make around the world off my website. It's not possible. So there's always going to be a requirement, an element for distribution partners and brick and mortar partners mm -hmm. or retail partners, if you want to call them that, because they are still the lion's share. I mean, when we talk about this pandemic exploding the online consumer experience, it's still less than 40 percent. So that means 60 percent of the people. And I'm not talking about Martin. I'm talking about Everywhere. consumerism mm -hmm. in general. That means 60 percent of the people are still going to some other place other than their phone or PC right. to buy something. Um, I think we're going to, I think it'll slow a little bit. I think people will kind of go back to the, um, the process or the, 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 the satisfaction of walking into their store, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, especially, you know, walking into downstairs into your store, the, the sight and sound of a music store cannot be beat. Sure. Right? But there is, there is a, uh, a, a, a requirement that you fill all channels as a manufacturer. You got to do, you got to do the direct piece. You got to do the brick and mortar piece. Yeah, in some areas where you don't have um, direct partners or, or direct distribution, you have, part, you have distribution partners. Mm -hmm. you know, because as, you become a, as we've been benefiting being a global brand, you have a global presence you have to maintain. For sure. So now I've covered the nuts and bolts. Let, let me ask you, I'll ask one more of this question. That I've got this, okay. like last, this rapid five minute ending here. Uh -oh, I, I okay. imagine <laughs> in my head. But if you wanted to work at Martin Guitars, what's and just a general... Like if you're being interviewed at Martin Guitars, regardless of if it's a manufacturing position or if it's a inside sales position or whatever, what do you think are key things that someone who's watching this is interested in potentially, like they see, they go on the Martin's website, they see the hiring position. Yeah, sure. And they're gonna walk in and they're gonna speak to somebody in that department. What does Martin Guitars value in their perspective people? Like what are the, the traits that you need to have walking in the door? Well, you know, culture is, uh, culture is always the number one thing people talk about. Like, um, you know, I, I get a resume on my desk for somebody to be a salesperson. And they have a, a historic background of being successful. But I know where they were successful. And I've, I've known them through the industry. And I'm like, I'm not sure that guy would fit in mm -hmm. or gal would fit in. And it's nothing. It's usually not anything specific. Martin family is, is, is absolutely a Martin family. Um, I know that personally because of some of the trials and tribulations from a health perspective that I've reached, you know, gone through recently. And when companies say they want to act like a family, then they have to. Mm -hmm. And this company acts incredibly like a family. Chris, all the way down through his executive leadership, his senior leadership, and the people on the floor, we all kind of care for one another. You're always going to find somebody who might not be, you know, yeah. dialed in like the rest of us. Sure. You know, but... Um, it, you can feel it. You've walked yeah, in the factory. Sure. You know everybody kind of digs what they do, and they dig what they do because they're treated with respect. You know, everybody always wants to make a nickel more. Sure. Everybody always wants the best parking spot. But if you have people that are not leaving after decades, you must be doing something, something right. 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 So, you know, I talked my daughter into working at Martin five years ago. Oh, no kidding. I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah, so she, she graduated from college, and she was kind of like, do I go back to school to do something else, or do I continue working at the at the restaurant and making a couple of nickels. And that, it was one of, the, one of the booms that Martin was kind of going through at the time. So why don't you give that a shot? Honestly, I thought she'd go back to school. Yeah. Right, because I figured you're not gonna want to work in a factory. She loved it. She was a second shift um, sander. Okay. Right? And on second shift, it's a little different. You gotta, you gotta learn a couple of more jobs mm -hmm. because uh, you, you gotta be a little bit master of all. Right? Sure. Because it's a, less of a, of a, of a staff. Um, she loved it moved to the point where she could come on day shift, um, was involved in all the extracurricular activities. We had a, we had a parade come through town and she was the <laughs> Freddie. You know, it's a big, a big guitar with her face sticking yeah, through yeah. She just embraced that, that, sure. that process to the point where now she's in customer service and now she's in, she's in that role. And I would not be surprised. You know, I'm, I'm hoping that I get another 10 or 15 years at Martin. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be surprised if she's, you know, one of those people that 
30 years from now is still at Martin Guitar because she kind of digs it. Yeah, that's wild. That's, that's really cool. I didn't know you got to work with her because you also work, let's move transit with your okay. son, right? Yeah, you work I do. with your son. I so do. this is the part where it's like, we've done a deep dive. Oh no. We've done, <laughs> we're on like page 13 of Google. And it's just like just getting through all the different Jerry Lawlers. So your son is a real <laughs> Peel estate the agent. Onion back. Exactly. And you do real estate with him. I do, uh, very, part, very part time. But um, so it, he's been in real estate over a decade and he's been, you know, very successful. And, um, I'm very fortunate to have really, I have three children and, and obviously a wonderful wife. I, uh, I have a great relationship with, with my family. They pick on me all the time. <laughs> That's why it's a good That's relationship. Great. Keeps, as long your, as they keeps your head from getting big. Correct. <laughs> so, I don't know, a couple of years back, um, I, used to, I used to officiate um, a PIAA basketball and baseball. And that was really just to get beer money. It, mm-hmm. wasn't, it wasn't really a second income. But the money allowed you to justify being away from the house. I'm on the road all the time. Sure. So my wife would be like, really? Another thing? Yeah. Um, and then as, as my body began to break down as I got older, and I realized I couldn't run up and down a basketball court. My son stuck in my head. Well, why don't you get your real estate license? I'm like, how am I going to do that? I'm on the road all the time. Yeah. Pandemic happens and real estate courses go online. Because you have to, there's so many hours of classes sure. that you have to do before you take the, the state and national test. So fast forward, it's uh, January of 2021. I take the test and uh, I joined the Chris Lawler team. That's good. Estate. Yeah, I saw that. that was really cool. So you know, it's like I got to work with my family growing up, which is like probably the most rewarding part of like my path. I always think it's neat. And now, you know, it's like my, you know, I have Empire, but we, I also have a piano shop where my dad works. And it's like, it's, it's kind of like come full circle. It's, it's a rewarding part of the business. Uh, so it's cool that you get to work with two of your three kids. But let's cool. talk about this this PIA basketball because I came obviously I'm from Pittsburgh, Chargers Valley. Tim McConnell who's like a legendary high school basketball coach. His sure. son played for the Sixers. Yep. His son played now for the Pacers. And I was thinking like during the pandemic you had angry dealers. Which was worse, the parents at basketball oh. games or, <laughs> parents an- or, or angry dealers no. during the pandemic? I would tell you it's parents at basketball games. Hands down. I mean, look, we had some heated conversations with dealers because let's let's be honest. You needed what I make so that you could you know keep yeah. the lights on, mm-hmm. and uh, so and that's a that's a very passionate conversation. But so is little Johnny at 13 <laughs> years old running up and down the court, and I called a foul on him. I'm the I'm the boogeyman. Yep. Right? So yeah, I'll uh, I'll take a screaming dealer <laughs> versus versus a mom in the bleachers any day. I think because there were there's not a long line of Ravitas in the NBA. Like, my <laughs> parents were always very mellow at these events because I don't think they they think they knew our path. Was, I, I use that line all the time. Um, I would say you know, LeBron James is not playing today, guys. Yeah. Yeah. You know? I was telling Brandon the story. I, I was doing uh, softball umpiring uh, for a tournament, and this, these were like nine and ten year old kids. And this coach has beaten me the whole, <laughs> my strike zone couldn't have been worse that day. And he, you know what, he probably was right. Yeah. You know, it's, it, it, is, it is nine-year-old girls. <laughs> and at the end of the game, he's coming over to give me my, my lofty $35 paycheck. And he says, you're the worst umpire I've ever had. I go, wow, that's a, that's a powerful <laughs> statement. The worst ever. And he goes, you destroyed these girls today. And as he says that, a mom in the background says, who wants ice cream? And these girls go, me! <laughs> right? And I looked yeah. at the coach and go, those girls? Yeah. You know, let's put things in perspective. For sure. You know? And uh, it, it, it's a fun time. And I, and I do think, I do think you know, to have a social commentary on that alone, you're going to have problems getting scholastic school sports completed because of the lack of referees. And it ain't because it's never been about the money. No. yeah, It's just... never been. Because if it was about the money, there'd be nobody doing sure. it. Sure. Um, but, but it's about, you know, you know, you go to a basketball ball game and you make a bad call, you're worried about getting beat up out, yeah. out in the parking lot. That's, that's insanity. Dude. No. Which, but if you did get beat up, <laughs> oh, no. I know you have a history as an ambulance captain. Oh, geez, you really do. This is it. So in the 90s, so to wrap up, because now, now you have, like, because obviously if you're getting beat down. I also by, worked at McDonald's bunch, when I was 16. A so. bunch of fourth grade girls <laughs> attack you from the knees and they take you down. An ambulance captain. Yeah. How does it happen? Well, so, um, you know, we're living, in, we're living in Pennsylvania. I have this New York accent, and um, my wife and I are here two or three years, and, we're not, you know, we're struggling. Um, parts of Lehigh Valley can be very um, inclusive and exclusive if you're not part of the, part of the family. And um, one of my children got sick, and people I don't know came to my house, took care of my son like it was their own, and he was three or four years old. Yeah. And um, 
Fortunately, it wasn't anything serious, but it was serious enough that we needed an ambulance to come in. Okay. They made me and my wife and everyone in my family feel at ease. Everything was going to be fine. And I thought that was um, powerful. Sure. Um, so on a whim, I said to my wife one Monday night, you know, in, in, in our area of Pennsylvania, Monday night is drill night. That's when you see all the firemen get together and they practice with the hose. And all sure. That. I had no desire to run into a burning building. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I figured I'd help the people run. Yeah, yeah, out. that sounds good. <laughs> so um, I, I joined the, uh, the fire company um, and was overwhelmed with the fact that they, they needed help. Yeah. People, they need volunteers. Sure. So I figured, all right, you know, again, I was early in my, my, my sales career. I wasn't managing a team. I was managing myself. And, and it seemed to work. And another study course and a state test and uh, um, worked myself through the ranks of a very small ambulance corps where I became ambulance captain. And all that means is that you're the guy who does, does all the calls. Sure. Only because, you know, there, was five, there were five of us that could run an ambulance. Yeah. So, but it was very, I did that for six years. And, yeah. uh, I also did it a little part time, you know, as a, as a as a dad struggling with three kids. Uh, I also used to do that for a couple of bucks an hour. Yeah. I would do overnight shifts, and uh, it it it, uh, it allowed me to to kind of give back. I was very blessed to have I have very healthy children, I have a very healthy family, and it was my ability to give back to the community and it felt good. Well, that's amazing. It's really cool because you know your history is. Uh is, you know, it's like I always find people to be really interesting as you get to talk to them, you find what leads them somewhere and the things that attract them to a place um, like where they work, you know, and, and Martin Guitars is an iconic brand. Yeah. Um, you know, it's just like, an, um, I, I feel like it's a privilege for us to interact with you as a dealer. It's a privilege to go to the factory and like it's a privilege for you guys to come out. And, but it feels that way because the people are great. You know what I mean? And that's like something that is really, I mean, I have a lot of friends at Martin Guitars, you know what I mean? It's just, like, it always feels good, like even if it's once a year at NAM to see them or whatever, or you guys come out or I come out, it's great. But I wanna thank you for being here. It's Jerry Lawler, Director of Sales North America, who is the worst softball empire of all time. <laughs> we, have a dick, we found that out, but a great uh, asset to Empire and to Martin Guitars, and I really appreciate you for your time. And thanks for doing the first industry insider with wow. us here at Empire with Outstanding. an industry expert. It can only go up from here. That's right. That's the new best line. You won't be the worst interview of all. <laughs> there you go. Thanks, buddy. You Thanks for your time. You got it. Thanks a lot.